Hello everyone, from wherever you are joining us and with whatever thoughts, fears, hopes, dreams, burdens you may come, welcome to our bandside worship today. Calling us into worship, God forcefully reminds us that action for justice is a core but often overlooked aspect of our religious life, God says. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice, to break the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to shatter every yoke? And St Paul insists, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Let us never allow ourselves to be burdened by a yoke of slavery again. For we are all daughters and sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Among us there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. So then, if we belong to Christ, we are descendants of Abraham and Sarah, heirs of the promises of God. Let us pray. God of all, restless for change, restless for justice and peace, restless for truth and reconciliation, restless for an end to the old ways of domination and oppression, restless for the growth of the new ways of inclusion and equality. We come to you in worship today, captive and shaped by history, society and forces beyond our control, yet open to the power of your Spirit. Through us, through our gifts and our talents, our commitment to a better world, may others know that when anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has ended and the new has begun. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you can remember, last September, thanks to Betsy's vision and hard work, we held a service here in Banside to celebrate the life and legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. That night, our service was graced and deeply, deeply enriched by Willetta and Rwanda, both women of colour. They are going to contribute to our worship again today. Let me introduce them. Willetta is an African-American poet and writer. She is a follower of Jesus who has been profoundly influenced by Dr. King. She lives in Northern Ireland and calls this place home. Rwanda was born and brought up in Northern Ireland. Her family is mixed race and she was given the name Rwanda in honour of her grandparents who were from the African country of Rwanda. After the unbearably brutal death of George Floyd and the wave of revulsion and protest it set off around the world, Willetta and Rwanda contacted Betsy and in their time of sharing indicated that they would be open to speaking to us in Banside. Let me say that I am humbled. They wanted to make that offer and felt that they could. Today in worship, Willetta and Rwanda will reflect with us on their experiences. It is, I have to tell you, a powerful witness. And right at the start, I want to thank Rwanda and Willetta for it. Willetta will now lead us deeper into worship in an affirmation of trust and hope, even in the face of racism. Where are you from? That accent does not sound familiar. I am from a kingdom not of this world. In fact, the streets are paved with gold. I was born in a place that my great grandparents did not choose. Stolen from our motherland, chained up and forced to work another land. From those older generations, we were home for the songs that we sung strung up on trees because our hair tended not to move in the breeze. 
extra melanin meant my sons came into the world deemed a felon, but it started in the cotton fields, a certain heavy to our steps. From then till now, our freedom from the chains of the field to the system, putting drugs on our streets, mothers being cracked out, then told conveniently to abort the children for the future. Chains came from the inside out now. The plan is still to wipe us out now, but the heavy to our step sways to the sound of Dr. King singing, we shall not, no, we shall not be moved. We shall not. No, we shall not be moved. My accent is tuned to my history. I am made from fire and dust. And I will continue to lift my eyes up because I know where my help comes from. Thank you, Willetta. Now listen to a reading from Matthew chapter 25. It reminds us that we and the societies of which we are a part are called to live by compassion and justice. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate the peoples one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you beloved of God Almighty, take the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of these sisters and brothers of mine, you did for me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord for us this day. Thanks be to God. Amen. You know, growing out of Isaiah's prophetic wisdom, Isaiah's insight, Isaiah's challenge, the community of Jesus gathered around Matthew's gospel insisted that how we treat people is really important. It is, in fact, of ultimate importance. One of the slogans adopted by the Black Lives Matter movement is, No justice, no peace. That slogan originated in response to the harassment and murder of African Americans by whites way back in the 1980s. Matthew's message can be made into a similar slogan, no compassion, no salvation, no justice, no chance of heaven. Compassion and justice, producing authentic peace, are central to Matthew and to all the prophets standing behind him as part of the great cloud of witnesses to this understanding of faith and life. As Jeremiah put it in a nutshell, no justice, no knowledge of God. So, no justice indicates no meaningful knowledge of God and therefore no living relationship with God. And I hope you noticed that for Matthew, compassion and justice are not only personal qualities to be displayed in the private sphere, they should also be the focus of government policy. Jeremiah understood this full well. Remember, it was the lack of justice at government level that drove his prophetic denunciation 
of the way things were. Then, taking the prophetic agenda forward, Amos and Isaiah asserted that justice was the goal and the responsibility of all governments everywhere. Building on this, as Matthew indicates, it is not only as individuals that we come before the judgment seat of God. It is also as nations and as ethnic groups. There is a lot to reflect on here about how we have viewed one another and treated one another down the years, as nations, as groups and as individuals. It brings into play issues close to home, such as sectarianism and nationalism. It also brings into play major forces that have shaped the history of our world, such as colonialism and imperialism. In many people, these gave rise to an attitude of superiority to those who were different. This then paved the way to excusing the abuse and in some cases the obliteration of those regarded as inferior. Here, the tentacles of exploitation, ethnic cleansing, genocide, racism and slavery begin to creep around us. All of this is huge and important. It has many levels and dimensions and stories to tell. It has many faces and manifestations and variations we cannot possibly begin to tackle them all at once, from the treatment of Native Americans to the experience of blacks in apartheid South Africa. But as we wade in the waters of the past, we can acknowledge that all of this forms the deep, bitter background to the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent global reaction. I imagine that when people of colour saw that white knee on George Floyd's neck, relentlessly crushing the breath and the life out of him without mercy, it triggered a community flashback to the ways of slavery, to the chains, to the lynching, to all the cruel instruments designed and devised by white men to crush the life and the spirit out of black people. Today, against this historical hinterland, the heart of our worship is going to consist of listening to the testimony of friends of Banside who are females of colour living right here in Northern Ireland. The purpose isn't to make us feel bad. It's to make us more aware of the currents of racism flowing around us. It's to better equip us to be part of the healing rather than perpetuating the hurt. So in a moment, Rwanda will tell us her story. Then we will sing together the hymn of hope and inclusion, Let Us Build a House Where All Can Dwell. After that, Waleta would share two of her powerful poetic reflections. Between them, her teenage daughter Grace will read an essay she has written in light of recent events. Following that, Jane Hudson will lead us in a prayer for our world. Rwanda will round off this section by singing the anthem Change Gonna Come. Honestly, I don't really know where to start with this video. I want to start off by saying that I'm not purposely trying to make you feel uncomfortable with what I say, but if you do feel uncomfortable, then um, that shows that there's room for change um, within yourself. I think I just want to start off by saying that even though there's not that much police brutality in, in Northern Ireland and the UK, racism still exists massively um and it's something i've had to deal with my whole life growing up obviously as a mixed race child and it's something that's like stuck with me and it really does play on your mind and your self-worth and your identity and who you are as a person and that's something that i really 
want to do by spreading this message of change that I want to be able to claim back my life and claim back a part of me that I hid away because I was made to feel embarrassed of it. So I'll start by sharing some of my experiences. I've I've had so many people tell me to go back to where I'm from. That's the classic one. That's just the one that everyone goes to straight away. The first thing that people want to say whenever they want to hurt you is go back to where you came from. It's hurtful for anyone, but um, more so for me and even more annoying for me because I'm, I am where I came from. This is where I was born. This is my country. And even if I wasn't born here, I've got every right to be here. I just think it's such a closed minded and nasty thing to say to somebody is if you have a right to tell them where they should be and where they should live because this is where I'm from and I should feel safe to be here. But sometimes I don't. Another thing is being in work. Um, You know, work is somewhere you go just to do your job, to make money and to get by, but I'm going to work and being treated completely differently than everybody else just because I'm half black. Like people touch me, they touch my hair, they'll touch my skin, even though they think that it's a compliment it's actually really degrading because it makes me feel like I'm not worthy enough of respect, which isn't true at all, but that's just how you're made to feel after so many years of people treating you as if you're like an animal or some sort of circus show. Another thing that happens to me in work is um, people asking me where I'm from so instead of telling me to go back where I'm from, they want to know where I'm from. Um, and obviously my answer to that is here, or I was born here. I was born in Northern Ireland, but that's never a good enough answer. People always have to answer back with, yeah, but where are you really from? And I'm sure you've heard plenty of people say that exact phrase before. Um, but it's so hurtful and offensive that you can't just leave the answer there. They always want to know more um, and they always seem to dig. And I've had people say to me that your accent is really good. Your accent sounds really Northern Irish. Like how long have you lived here for? After I've just told them that I was born here as if like my answer just isn't good enough because they don't get the answer that they want and they get annoyed at me and tell me that I'm wrong, which is just so frustrating. I've had people laugh at my name badge because obviously my name is Rwanda. I'm named after the country where my grandparents are from. I've had people laugh at it and ask if my mum and dad went on a fancy holiday and then came up with that name. Um, But that name holds so much, so much meaning and so much love behind it. Um, that's where my grandparents are from on my mum's side who I unfortunately didn't get to meet because they both passed away before I was born but that name means a lot and for somebody to just kind of laugh at it and I've had people just degrade it and people that can't even be bothered to learn how to pronounce it or spell it It's just, it just feels really unfair. I'm obviously just, I see myself as just a Northern Irish person. I'm just the same as everybody else that's Northern Irish. But I'm made to feel like I'm so incredibly different. um, And that it's something that should be pointed out and put down at all times, pretty much, almost every day. Of course, I absolutely love having black African heritage that's something that I'm now so so proud of um so I I wouldn't want anyone to ever say they don't see my color because of course you do like I am black I am half black I am half African I do have differences I was brought up with a different culture obviously half Northern Irish as well but the foods that I get and the music that I listen to and places that I went or things I experienced um molded me into a slightly different person than somebody that would have both Northern Irish parents but that doesn't 
mean that you should point that out and diminish it and make me feel bad for it. It's something that should be celebrated. Everybody's culture should be celebrated and everybody should be made to feel like they matter. And that's obviously where the phrase Black Lives Matter comes from. It's Black Lives Matter, I know, can be a controversial thing to say, but if you break it down in a way that I'm sure a lot of people have seen now, um, Black Lives Matter doesn't mean that only Black Lives Matter. It means that Black Lives Matter too. And for not even a few years, it's been hundreds of years, um, black people were made to feel like they didn't matter. And it's still prominent today. I'm 24 and it's 2020. And I still get made to feel like I don't matter. And that's nothing to do with people, you know, being violent or I'm not being held down by police. I'm not having a gun pointed at me. It's all the little things that so many people don't even realise is difficult to grow up in. It literally is just like a whole another world. You can't walk into a normal cosmetic store and find your shade of makeup. It doesn't go dark enough in most shops, which is so ridiculous because black people have existed for forever. Growing up, I was so embarrassed of my hair. There were no products for it. It was just chemicals to straighten it. So that's obviously how I grew up thinking that my hair should be, which then resulted in me chemically straightening it so much that it, I completely went bald. It was all gone. And since it grew back, I just decided that I should be proud of who I am. I shouldn't have to hide that at all. I've just had people be so horrible, call me names. I've had men multiple times hit me and kick me because they wanted to use derogatory terms towards me and I stood up for myself and they didn't like that. Just a, it's a really hard thing to grow up being black or mixed in a world that only sees you for a stereotype. Like you should never put anybody in a box, but you should never put somebody in a box just because of their skin color. I didn't choose to be this skin color. There's millions of different things I could have chosen to be for people to judge me on, but skin color definitely shouldn't be one of them.
To my black sons, hear me when I say I cry for you. I cry for my sister's son and my cousin's baby too. Land of the free, home of the brave, we thought we were done being slaves. Our president cannot even stop the slaughter of our sons and our daughters. Wrong place, wrong time, same song, same rhyme. Stop your crime and you won't get shot. I cry only at night for you, son. In the light of the day, I hold my head up and I laugh with you. I am a queen who gave birth to only princes. We are a strong people. Chained before, lynched before, hunted down even yet today. Sing, play, write, learn, breathe, but never ever give up. This is a letter to my generation. The Black Lives Movement has been going on for many, many years now. It has been a struggle for years and many people have lost their lives while fighting for the cause. While it is amazing to see so many teenagers sharing about Black Lives Matter and giving their opinions on it, it is so important to get even more uncomfortable. Don't just post a picture and put a hashtag and be done with it. This is people's lives we're fighting for. It takes a lot more than hashtags to save thousands of lives. It takes people being willing to have uncomfortable conversations with their family members, educating themselves with documentaries, books, and being willing to have a whole new perspective that will change the way their family and friends see black lives. We have to get uncomfortable to make a difference. I have had to have uncomfortable conversations with certain family members about black lives that made me upset because not everyone sees it the same. This is why we have to work to try and change the opinions of our family or else racism will continue to be taught into the next generations. Be very careful. If you're one of those people that make racist jokes in school or any other place for that matter, hopefully what has happened in the world recently has made you realise that you're wrong and have been wrong to continue to do what you do. The sad thing is it shouldn't have taken the recent murders of black people for you to realise this. I suggest that you especially take a look at yourself and stop making your ignorant and uneducated jokes. There are many topics to joke about, but people's ethnicity is not and will never be one in which you can make ignorant comments and generalisations about. Being mixed race growing up in Northern Ireland hasn't always been easy for me. I have dealt with many unenlightened and ignorant people to put it nicely. You may think you're funny and you may think you're impressing your friend group, but people like you are the reason racism is normalised in school. This makes teenagers think that it is acceptable to put people of other races down or look at them differently and it is not okay. Don't be fooled into thinking that you're better when you aren't. You're just uneducated. So change that. Post and share about the Black Lives Matter movement, but make sure that you're doing more than just that, because it isn't enough at this point. We have to make a serious change, and if that means people starting to get a bit uncomfortable, it has to and will be done. I know where I stood on this side of history. Raised fist in Belfast City. I was not born in, but all heart. I know where I stood as the worldwide shouts for justice screamed loud. Raised fist with a city torn for years and not unknown by troubles, together we stood. I know where I stood on this side of history. As the list of names in early graves rang out on the streets, George, Ahmad, Brianna, Raised fists, we said his name. I know where I stood the day the world had enough of not being able to breathe, yet we all wore a mask and washed our hands of every possible nasty virus. 
we stood together. We screamed out for justice of the murdered black stories, pen snatched by hate hatched powers full of too much power. History made on the streets. History made in isolation. As long as we keep having conversations. So murder is not on repeat like a broken record of the unsaid silence. We are in a pandemic now, but there are two. We have been in a murderous pandemic all of our lives. Having heard such powerful witness and challenge, we bring our prayers for our world. Let us pray. Loving, restless God, as we remember our world, shaken by coronavirus and plagued by racism, brutality, sexism, domination of others, oppression, injustice, exploitation. We also remember that too often we have learned to speak almost every language except our own. Too often we show that we are well schooled in the language of hate and fear, of greed and anxiety. We know quite well the language of empty superiority and excessive deference. But deep down we know too that all this is profoundly distorting and that none of it can lead to healing, reconciliation and peace. As your people, Help us to find our true voices. Help us to speak our mother tongue of faith, hope, trust, resistance, protest, generosity, peace and love. Help us to be part of a transforming presence in the world as we join together to end discrimination and build equality, a world where all may breathe free, flourish and find value. Keep us close to Jesus, who knew our mother tongue best, spoke it most clearly and lived it most fully. As he taught us, hear us now as we pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Keep us from the time of trials and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forevermore. Amen. Change gonna come. Oh, yes, 
to will Then I go to my brother I said, brother, would you help me, please? But he winds up knocking me Right back down my knees Carry on. It's been a long, oh, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Really, on behalf of Bandside and everyone else joining. I just want to thank Willetta, Rwanda and Grace for their talent, for their courage, for their conviction, for their challenge. I want to thank them for their honesty, their insight, for their vulnerability. I want to thank them for opening our eyes more widely to the nature of racism, to the depth of racism, to the impact of racism and to the reality of the journey we are on to eradicate racism. Remember this, on the journey, we are surrounded and encouraged by a great cloud of witnesses. These witnesses include people like Moses the Liberator and his wife Zipporah. They were a mixed race couple, you know. The witnesses include Isaiah, who as he learned more and more about the nature of God, came to understand that the community of God's people includes every race and all nations. And then there is Jesus, who stands in closest solidarity with those who suffer most. There are women in history, like Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Ida B. Wells, Rosa Parks, there are men like Martin Luther King Jr., W.E.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey. Today, I want to give the last word of witness to Willetta. But before that, hear these words to accompany us on our journey. They are from a really powerful African-American hymn about overcoming the legacy of slavery and traveling with hope into the future. They say, lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Facing the rising sun, of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. In all the ways we can, let us continue our calling to end oppression and prejudice as we work for equality, justice, reconciliation and peace. The beloved community begun by Jesus and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the sweet, sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit guide and sustain us on our way this day and forevermore. Amen. And now over to Willetta. These past few days since George Floyd was murdered have been very difficult. Um, there's been a mourning of sorts of sorts for people of color, for Caucasian people, for people around the world. And I believe that the vulnerability of having these conversations, especially for people of color, have been completely exhausting. I know that for myself and for my, my children, a lot of these difficult conversations have left surprising results, surprising reactions, difficult reactions, 
from some of our family members. And there is a mourning. There's a mourning that we have had in our blood for decades upon decades upon decades. And so what I would say and encourage the church in is to keep sharing your stories, to keep having conversations. Do not let the uncomfortable conversations stop. Because when you have conversations with the older generation that might sleep in ignorance, and when you have conversations with the younger generation that might also sleep in ignorance, that's when truth comes to the surface. And so I'm so thankful for Betsy. I'm so thankful for Mark. I'm thankful for Rwanda, or my daughter, that we can open the door to have these conversations in peace and that we can stand together and see this world change for the better.